what are we hoping to accomplish today? At the Blandon Foundation, we've started referring to the current state of affairs as a crisis layer cake. We have a health crisis that drove an economic crisis that in turn has exacerbated social and racial issues that have gnawed at this country for centuries since its founding. And it's a lot to make sense of. And it's, it's also really easy to get caught up in dealing with the moment. We're all facing needs around feeding people, keeping businesses open, keeping our elders safe, promoting civility, advocating for justice. It's a lot. Yet at the same time, we'd be well served to keep at least part of our attention on the future. How do we take advantage of the current chaos to vision and fashion a better future? There's a very, very old piece of wisdom that says that in crisis, you find both danger and opportunity. So how do we build on the opportunity? When the design team, the process design team, was thinking about a presenter who could help challenge our thinking in this environment, we were looking for somebody who could draw lessons from the past, someone who is very well informed about current conditions on the ground, someone with the imagination to consider a different future, and finally, somebody who's shown an abiding commitment to generating transformational change in a more equitable future. So it's a tall order to fill, but uh, I think we've done that well. Mr. Kashkari brings a very robust background. Um, his experience with the financial crisis a decade ago, managing the TARP program, um, is a really interesting perch uh, to have viewed that point in our history. His current and present leadership at the Minneapolis Federal Reserve means that he has a, a very um, thorough view of what's going on in our economies in this region and um, has demonstrated a great commitment to uh, improving the lives of all of our people by establishing the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Center at the Minneapolis Federal Reserve. So, um, Neil, or Mr. Kashkari, I genuinely want to thank you for taking the time to meet with us today. Um, we're all busy, but I can only imagine you're probably busy squared. Um, I know we can benefit from your insights, but I think, and I think you recognize that you'll have a great opportunity to get uh, a more nuanced sense of what this group of leaders in rural Minnesota is thinking and what's on their mind. So I'll turn it back to Ann to switch us over to Mr. Kashkari. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you for that great introduction. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a really good opportunity for me, and I look forward to having our discussion. I always like to start, I'm only going to speak uh, fairly briefly here on the front end, just so we can get into the Q&A and the discussion, because uh, that's where I'm going to learn the most. So I'm, I'm here to share with you what we're seeing at the Federal Reserve, but I'm equally, or maybe even more importantly here to learn and hear from what you all are seeing in your communities or what's top of mind to you. And the more candid and direct you are with your questions to me or your comments, the more I'm going to learn. So I, I appreciate the opportunity for the back and forth. I always like to start by just level setting what the Federal Reserve is. A lot of people don't know a lot about it. We're the nation's central bank. We were created by the U.S. Congress in 1913. And our basic job is to try to manage the ups and downs of the U.S. economy so we have a more stable economic system. Uh, typically, we raise interest rates or lower interest rates. If the U.S. economy looks like it's overheating, the central bank will raise interest rates to make it more expensive to get a loan for a business or for a family to buy a house to try to tap the brakes on the economy. Uh, if it looks like the economy is going into recession, then the Federal Reserve will typically cut interest rates to make it cheaper to go out and get a loan and provide that economic activity. And we always talk about a dual mandate. Congress has assigned us two goals. One goal is stable prices, so inflation that's in check. Think of an economy that's growing steadily. The other is maximum employment. As many Americans as possible who want to work are able to find jobs. 
usually those things are linked like a seesaw. And as the economy gets hotter, the unemployment rate goes down, it becomes difficult for employers to find workers, salaries have to go up, <clears throat> that leads to inflation. And so we're trying to balance these two sides of the seesaw. Well, right now, uh, because of the terrible COVID crisis, we have very, very high unemployment, and we have low inflation. Uh, the U.S. economy is in recession. It's, uh, I think the official declaration is that started sometime in February. So we're trying to provide as much stimulus, as much boost to the economy as possible to help us get through this COVID crisis. Another quick just background fact on the, on the Fed that I think is important for you to know, there's something unique about our nation's central bank. Back in 1913, when Congress designed it, they did not want it simply housed in Washington, D.C., in the middle of politics. They wanted it distributed around the country so the different regions of the country had a voice in this policymaking. So they created 12 independent Federal Reserve banks across the country, the ninth of which is here in Minneapolis, the Minneapolis Fed. And our jobs are literally, literally to represent all of you and your communities. The Minneapolis Fed covers Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, part of Michigan and Northwestern Wisconsin. And a big part of our jobs are to travel around the region to get to know what's happening in our local economies. And then I used to go back to Washington DC every six weeks, now we do it virtually. But a big part of what I'm doing in those meetings where we set interest rates for the nation, I'm speaking about what's happening here in our regional economy so that that is woven into our policy deliberations. Now we cannot set a different interest rate for Minnesota and for California and for New York because we all use the dollar. And so it's one interest rate for the whole country. So it's hard to pick one rate that's optimal for everybody. And you know, it's not gonna be perfect, but we do our best and making sure that our region has a voice in that deliberation is part, a big part of my job and how we try to get it right for the country as a whole. So this is why that background is important because this is why this discussion is important for me. It's important for me, rural uh, Minnesota is really important. Right? The Twin Cities are really important, but so is the rest of the state. So are the Dakotas, so are Montana. So getting out and meeting with different constituents, uh, nonprofits, civic leaders, et cetera, uh, it's a great source of information for us. So let me shift a little bit, just talk a little bit about the COVID crisis and where, we're, where we think we're going. Uh, the virus, what happens with the virus is going to determine what happens with the economy. So we're spending a lot of our time talking to health experts around the country and around the world. We're examining what is happening in other countries, what their experiences are. And there's a lot that the health scientists still don't know about the virus. Uh, we do know that we think eventually we have to get to some form of herd immunity. You know, 60, 70% of the population needs to have been exposed to the virus either organically or preferably through a safe vaccine. And then we could actually arrest this crisis and kind of go back to normal. Uh, I'm here in my basement of my house uh, in the suburbs of Minnesota. We have about a thousand employees at the Minneapolis Fed. 95% of them are working from home. We've been in this posture since early mid-March. And I would expect we're gonna be in this posture for some time to come. Uh, we're fortunate that we have the ability to work effectively remotely. And so there's no pressure on us to get back into our bank uh, quickly and to take health risks because we just don't have to. Obviously that's not true for everybody. And tens of millions of people have lost their jobs around the country. And a big question mark we all have right now is as people go back to work and as the economy starts to reopen, what happens to the virus? Does it start to spread again? And there's some indication that around the country that is happening. Uh, and it makes intuitive sense that it's happening. The scientists say that five to 10% of Americans at this point have been exposed to COVID, most of whom have recovered. So let's just assume that those five to 10% are now healthy and safe. Obviously some died, but most people have recovered from it. But that's a long way from 60 to 70% to get to herd immunity. And so as you go back to normal, whatever normal is, you would imagine the virus is gonna to start to spread again. And there may be a seasonality to this. You know, the flu that tends to be seasonal, summer as people move outdoors, outside of you know, conference rooms and air conditioning, uh, the flu tends to spread less. So we might be seeing in Minnesota, just as an example, uh, through mid-May, cases and hospitalizations and ICU admissions were climbing. 
Well, we started to reopen before we turned the corner. It's curious. You know, you would think that you'd want to reopen after you turn the corner. As a state, we reopen before we turn the corner. But nonetheless, now the cases have started to drop. So that's really good news. But it begs the question, is it dropping because of our public policy response? Or is it dropping because it got warm? And we went outside. And we go outside now more often. We just don't know. There's so much uncertainty right now about what's causing the virus to spread in some states and not others. Some states that have had tight lockdowns still spreading. Some states it, it isn't. So there's a lot that we don't know. My base case scenario is that we are going to continue to see uh, peaks, second waves, et cetera, uh, unfortunately, for the rest of the year until we get to some form of effective therapy or some form of vaccine or, or very, very widespread testing, and we're not there yet. So that means, what, why am I telling you this? That means our, our economic recovery is likely going to be bumpy and is going to be more muted. I, I wish I could tell you we can all just go right back to life as usual, go back to movie theaters, reopen the economy full blast, and we're back to the races. It seems like that's very unlikely at this point, uh, barring some type of uh, technological health, health technological breakthrough. A few other topics, and I'll turn it over, uh, we'll have the discussion. The Minneapolis Fed has a research center on uh, Indian country development. Indian country is a big part of our region, really important. We are looking at what can we do, what economic policy proposals could make a difference to try to bring more economic development into Indian country. The Minneapolis Fed has also done a lot of work over many years on the value of early childhood education, uh, just an absolute game changer in. Uh, giving children a chance at a success in the education, but also success in their career and more economic mobility. We continue to be committed to that work. Uh, we also, the last year, last six months, nine months, uh, former Supreme Court Justice Alan Page and I have been on a mission to amend Minnesota's constitution to make a quality public education a civil right for all children in Minnesota. That's absolutely about racial disparities, but it's equally about rural disparities. A lot of low-income kids in greater Minnesota are not getting the education that they deserve. Uh, and that is, it is leading them to be ill-equipped uh, to succeed in the modern economy. And we need them all to be well-equipped so that they can succeed in the modern economy. And then we've got a lot of other research programs focusing on uh, economic opportunity and inclusive growth. And uh, I'd love to you know, dive into all of that with you uh, as we get into Q&A. So that's my brief overview. Thank you for having me. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, it's, it's pretty exciting for us to have you here. Um, and as Wade said, we're really interested because our folks are dealing with the immediate crisis now, obviously, but we're also interested about what they should be doing to plan for an uncertain future. So as you look at this crisis layer cake that, that he described, what do you think rural leaders should be thinking about today to ensure that they're communities emerge whenever we do emerge, perhaps with a greater quality of life, a better economy, and, and importantly, that, that look at trying to address some of those historic racial injustices and inequities. Big question, but what should we be thinking about today? Well, you know, I think um, you, you all have many ideas. One thing that has opened my eyes, I've been an advocate publicly for the country investing in rural broadband. I just think as a country, we just need to do it. You know, we, we say that you're entitled to get access to the mail. You're supposed to get access to electricity. You should get access to high-speed internet. I think the thing that we've all learned in the last three months is it's an even bigger deal than I realized. Bigger deal in a good way. You know, I was, even though I thought rural broadband, we should just do it as a country, make it a reality for everybody. Even if we did that, I was a little bit skeptical that you know, there are all these trends to people moving to the cities going away for education, would rural broadband really be a game changer? I think it would be now. I think I've opened my eyes that many people are much more effective working remotely than perhaps we had appreciated. And you're seeing some com companies say, hey, we don't care where you live. We just want to hire the very best talent available. Boy, that is a potential game changer for many small towns across our region who offer great quality of life if they just had this one missing connection. And so I guess the question is, I know that it'd be great if the federal government would just say, hey, in part of the next stimulus bill, we're going to do it. That'd be the easiest way to solve it. 
or the state legislature doing it, but I just don't know, can cities just say, you know what, we're gonna bite the bullet and we're gonna do it. And we have, you know, otherwise we offer great quality of life for our families and our communities and kids when they, they go away to college, but then many of them wanna come back to the town that they grew up in. I, don't, I just don't know how realistic is it for an individual city to just say, we're gonna do it, we're gonna bite the bullet, we're not gonna wait for the state, or we're not gonna wait for the federal government. That to me is probably the single most important thing that really could, I think, change the trajectory of some of these towns that are facing pressures of young people leaving and then there's no economic opportunity. So they'd like to come back, but they can't. Thank you. You know, sort of a follow-up here. Um, some foundations, Blinding Foundation, and one of them has invested a lot of resource and energy into rural broadband. But are there other things that the philanthropic community can do to advance that, that spread of rural broadband? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, obviously the political process, you're very familiar with that. It is enormously important. I don't know if there are ways you could do pilots and say, you know, the philanthropic community comes together, partners with the town, and they cost share and say, we're just going to take it on ourselves as a pilot to show, hey, this is doable and it actually can lead to transformation. And we're going to pick a town and they're going to be the lucky ones and we're going to help them. And then hopefully that, that can lead to follow on investment from elected officials one idea, but I'm sure you all have, have better and more. Thank you. Um, Wade also mentioned the, the Great Recession of 2008 and your role during and after that in helping the country emerge from that. Are there lessons that you can take from that experience and, and have us think about now or that you would even apply now or in the midst of this crisis? A few things, one in the midst of it and one looking forward. In the midst of it, one of the mistakes we made in 2008, so I worked under both Presidents Bush and Obama in the US Treasury Department, and we had many housing programs to try to help homeowners keep their homes, avoid foreclosures in that housing crisis. There was a big political blowback because of the crisis, and many Americans said, I don't want my neighbor getting a bailout with my taxpayer dollars. He was irresponsible, he bought a house, he bought a boat, he bought two cars, don't bail him out. That, that influenced us in honesty. And so we tried to design programs that were narrowly targeted to people who were deemed quote unquote deserving. People who bought the right house, but now they just needed some assistance, a temporary bridge, because there was that big political blowback. Well, when we tried to narrow our programs onto who was quote unquote deserving, it ended up, we didn't help very many people. It slowed the programs down and it narrowed how effective they were. And I think the housing downturn was deeper than it needed to be because we were trying to save taxpayers money. In a sense, we cost the taxpayers more money by trying to save them money. And then an analogy that I use today is if you're, if heaven forbid your home is on fire, you just want the fire department to put the fire out. You're not gonna go and quibble with them about, well, you sprayed a little too much water over here and the garage didn't need it. It was really the kitchen that needed it. What were you doing? You're saying, no, just put the fire out. So my advice that I've been giving to fiscal policymakers, as you design your COVID response packages, don't worry about who's deserving and who's not deserving. We gotta put the crisis out. We gotta put the fire out. If you're penny wise, you could be penny wise and pound foolish. That was a mistake that we made. And I think that they've gotten that message. So a lot of the programs have been very broad. The PPP program, the small business program, you know, was, was very widely available. There's been some criticism that non-deserving people you know, took advantage of it, but I think by and large, it's been a pretty widely accessible program, so that's good. Now, looking forward, uh, there's been a lot of talk that could this crisis really lead to a transformation of our economy in a good way? Like this is a, don't let a crisis go to waste, transform the economy for the better. I hope so, but I'll tell you I'm skeptical. I thought the 2008 crisis would lead to big transformations in our economy, and our financial system, and it didn't. Almost nothing changed. The big banks have a little bit more capital than they had before, a few more regulations around them, but they're bigger than they were before. And the, you know, I think the other thing that changed after 08 is if you have a low credit score, it's very difficult for you to get a loan following 2008. So credit, the floor was lifted up, but for most of the rest of the financial system, not much changed. And so I think the question for all of us is, how do we use this moment to in fact make real change that is lasting? Because it's not gonna happen on its own. 
and the inertia of our society is big. Like there's a lot of inertia to just go back to the way things were. And if you look at this COVID crisis, what's so unfair is it is disproportionately affecting those who can least afford it. So I can work from home, right? So I'm not that affected. Uh, the vast majority of people who've been losing their jobs tend to be the lower wage service workers who can't work from home. They, they have fewer financial resources and that's where the uh, pain is disproportionately being felt. And so is this crisis gonna lead to changes in our economic system for the long term? I hope so, but it's not gonna happen automatically. It's only gonna happen if all of us make it a priority and do the work. Thank you. Um, sort of along those lines, a couple of questions in terms of policy and what can be done so that as we move forward, we know that the um, effects of the pandemic on rural are different than they are in urban. And what can the Fed be doing or think about doing to make sure that it addresses those differences and how the impact affects rural communities? Well, I think uh, I don't know that I don't have the specific answer other than we need a lot of active dialogue because as the as the crisis goes on, I think the effects are varying over time. You know, what we're going to see as we're reopening. I'll just give you an example. Uh, when is it going to make sense to reopen movie theaters? When is it going to make sense for you and me to take our family back out to a movie theater and be surrounded by a hundred people for three hours at a time? You know, boy, hard for me to see that. And so that's just one little example. Some businesses lend themselves to reopening safely. Uh, some businesses, let's say some restaurants, naturally have outdoor seating. So it's easier for them to reopen and maintain some safety. Some businesses don't. So I think it's going to be very varied. And I don't think it's simply uh, uh, urban versus rural communities. I think it's going to be community by community, almost business by business, in what assistance folks need and how they can, you know, some businesses might be able to, to adjust and transform themselves for a few years until we really get through this. Uh, it's just going it, to, there's going to be a lot of experimentation and we need to share best practices and share what we're learning. Thank you. So going from kind of the big picture, you know, community-wide, um, we also know that there are huge disparities, housing, um, income, and there are pre-depression highs. Are there things we should be thinking about now, sort of on the more granular level that look at can we emerge or put policies in place that help us emerge so that those inequities are narrowed? Again, using this almost as an opportunity. Well, housing is something that everywhere I travel around our region, lack of affordable housing comes up. It's clearly an issue in urban centers, but it's also an issue in rural communities. And it's you know, really made me wonder what's going on here. Why is it that if somebody in a family has a job or two jobs, they have an income, why can they not afford a place to live? And why aren't there developers coming in to build them an apartment or a townhouse or a house that they can afford? What's breaking down in the market? The biggest thing that we've identified is, and it's not only this, but a big thing is there are a lot of regulations that take place at the local level, which are well-intentioned, but that when you add it up, raise the minimum cost of a house for a low-income family. And I'm going to give you an extreme example from out of Minnesota. Uh, there's a policy now in California that every new house that gets built must have $10,000 roughly of solar panels on the roof. Very well-intentioned. Climate change is serious. we got to tackle it. We're going to do our part. And it directly raises the minimum cost of a house of a family by $10,000. And every time a policymaker comes up with a good idea like that, or let's add minimum number of bathrooms, minimum number of bedrooms, minimum number of car garages. Obviously, we need to have safety standards. We need some basic requirements. But every time you or I or someone comes up with one, a good idea, it's another layer on the ball of yarn. And that ball of yarn just gets bigger and bigger, and it just raises the minimum cost of homes. And so that's probably the, the most the thing that we can directly control, I mean, there's not much we can do about the price of steel or the price of lumber, but there's a lot we can do about these regulations that are driving up the minimum cost of a house. And that's really at the local level. It's not being set so much by federal policy, somewhat by state, but a lot of it is being driven by local policies. And so if we could confront that, I think that's something we could position ourselves for uh, a more affordable future. 
Um, as we look at the investments that the federal government currently is making, um, and looks like they'll be making more in trying to help the country cope, um, there are, there's a price tag with that. And what do you anticipate the long-term impact of these significant federal deficits will be as we start moving out, hopefully, um, on our bumpy, muted recovery? And one good thing is that the U.S. government has uh, extraordinary fiscal capacity. And even though the U.S. government is issuing a lot of debt and running big deficits, now huge deficits in response to the COVID crisis, investors around the world are still demanding our treasury bonds because they still have tremendous confidence in the U.S. economy. As tough an economic period we have right now, and as fractured as our political process seems to be, we're still better off than any other country in the world in terms of our economy and our political system and all of it working together and our legal system. And so investors around the world are still saying, we'd rather invest in America than basically anywhere else. So we have the capacity, the US government has the capacity to borrow the money it needs to support the American people and the American economy through this crisis. But then we have to start growing the economy again. And then ultimately we do have to get our fiscal house in order. It's one thing to say, we have a temporary crisis and we're gonna borrow money to deal with that crisis. Another positive option is, well, we have big investments we wanna make, so we're gonna borrow money to make these investments, let's say in rural broadband, as an example, because that kind of an investment will have some payback in terms of economic growth and productivity. It's another thing to say, we're gonna run big deficits forever just to fund our current consumption. You can't do that forever. And so if you, if you forecast out the um, projection of the U.S. government's debt over the next 20, 30, 40 years. It goes to, through the roof because of predominantly Social Security and Medicare. And those, are going, those go into the red, so to speak, because they're funded by current workers paying for current retirees. And we're not having kids at the same rate that prior generations had. So those programs go into imbalance. So one thing that I've talked about a lot since I've been in the Fed is the need for more legal immigration to feed our economy. Now, right now, we're in the middle of an acute crisis. A lot of people are laid off. This is not an issue this month or for the next year or two. But longer term, if we want to sustain our Social Security benefits, if we want to sustain our Medicare benefits without issuing record levels of debt or without dramatically raising taxes, the only way you do that is by having more people working in our economy. And we're not having enough kids. So immigration has got to be the answer. That's just math. And by the way, sorry, this is a long answer. I travel around Minnesota and I'd say this, and usually people say, wow, I didn't realize that either we, I always joke that you've got three choices. You can accept slower growth. You can try to subsidize fertility. You can try to pay families to have more babies. It doesn't really work, by the way, but you could try. Japan is trying that. Or you can embrace immigration. One time I had somebody say, you know what? I'll take slower growth. Every other time that I've said that in audiences of a few hundred people, people say, wow, you know, immigration may not be my first choice, but I, now I realize how important it is for our economy to thrive. And especially in rural America, where in many cases populations are dwindling, immigration could be a very important uh, support for their economy. We have a, a question related to that. And um, and particular, the meatpacking industry, where we have so many, particularly in our part of the country, um, immigrant workers um, being deemed essential. And I think in other parts of the country, immigrant workers being considered essential in other areas. Is this the time to make the case for immigration reform because of that? Because we have relied so much on folks who are in tough jobs who might not get great pay. Um, is this the time to really is an opportunity there to make a change on immigration policy? I, mean, I, I would love to say yes. I'm, I'm skeptical that the political dynamics, given what they are, with 15, 20% of Americans out of work today, I think it'd be a tough case to make that, hey, we need to open the doors to more legal immigration uh, in this moment. Though, you, you know, we all hope and expect that the economy is going to recover over the next few years people will go back to work 
And then what is the what is our long term economic growth look like? So look, I, I think the person who asked the question is exactly right. Many immigrants are playing vitally important roles in our economy, both in the meatpacking plants. I visited the, uh, the uh, JBS plant in Worthington a couple of years ago, the pork plant, uh, mostly immigrant workers, from what I could, from what I can tell, uh, or doctors and nurses. I mean, all across our society, I think many immigrants are playing vitally important roles. But I think the politics are tough. Um, speaking of tough things, um, a little bit of a transition. Um, the, the note that you made earlier that the financial industry has made some minor changes, but not really significant ones. Do you think that the pandemic, the emergence from it, is an opportunity to look at a different way to spend capital, to maybe invest it more in community-based types of financial institutions so that there is the opportunity to put that money to use in, in more of a community development type of activity? I think, I think potentially, you know, I mentioned earlier the PPP program, the Paycheck Protection Program, which is about six or seven hundred billion dollars of uh, forgivable loans to small businesses to help them get through the pandemic. The vast majority of those loans have been made by community banks all across the country. And that was actually, you know, community banks love to say, you know, we know our communities, we know our neighbors, we know our small businesses. Big banks cannot serve our communities the way we do. And it's a great talking point. But it was proved to be true uh, in this crisis because when small businesses said, you know, we need some help from the federal government, and when the federal government said, how do we reach thousands and thousands of small businesses across the country, there was no way the Small Business Administration or the Treasury Department or the Federal Reserve could reach all those businesses directly you had to go through banks and banking relationships, and you really saw community banks step up and be this very important pipeline across the country. Now, it wasn't perfect. There are still some businesses that don't have existing banking relationships, uh, but at this point, there's still money that is un unspent, so to speak, from that program. So more money is available. So there's been enough time for business businesses to make those banking relationships and try to get access to the program. So I think that that was a proof point that the community bank network that we have around the country is serving a very important role. And I think community development financial institutions have also been part of that. They are part of this program. By the way, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is providing the backup funding for all of these institutions that are making these loans. So then they can bring them to the Minneapolis Fed or the, or the whole Federal Reserve for funding. So I, I do think, whether it's CDFIs or community banks, I do think they have a very important role to play. And I do not think we would have been well served if we just had five giant national banks and we didn't have these community banks spread out across the country. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another type of industry that's critically important, particularly in rural Minnesota, is the healthcare industry. It's, it's important not only to the residents, but as, a, as an economic driver. And we've seen uh, a shrinking in the number of rural hospitals that are there and the, the quality of services available. Um, what do you think the long-term impact is going to be on some of these rural healthcare systems, the, the economic health, you will, if you will, of our, our rural healthcare systems? And are there things we should be doing now to preserve them? Well, I think it's a, this is a tough one. I think, you know, I, I visited in South Dakota, they have a telehealth center. I visited there a couple of years ago and they're providing telehealth services uh, to the country from some of their doctors in South Dakota. So I think this crisis has shown that telehealth, remote, you know, talking to your doctor by video, it's effective. It can't do everything, but it actually can provide some important, an important, at least initial level of care. And so I think making, going back to the broadband comment, making sure that people across rural Minnesota have access to broadband so they can get access to specialists and doctors, even if they're not in their own town. But I also think it, it's a challenge. I mean, I just, you know, my wife and I had a, a baby um, 18 months ago, and we've been blessed being in the Twin Cities, having so many great hospitals and so many doctors to choose from. It's just been very uh, easy for us and comforting. And then I meet people from across the state, young families who don't have that access to that, who it's hard to go see an OB or where are they going to deliver their baby. I think that becomes a challenge. So when we think about the future of rural America, even if we solve the broadband, you still need physical proximity to basic quality healthcare, right? You can't, you can't deliver a baby online. And so 
you know, how do we solve that? I don't think we figured that out yet. And I think that's a tough one because there's something to be said for scale, right? If you have a lot of people living in a community, it's easier to support a hospital with all the facilities that you would want or need. If we end up being much more spread out, that becomes more challenging. And I don't have an answer to that yet. Didn't really expect you would, just your thoughts. Um, and another question has to do with the indicators that we, we rely on to tell us um, how our communities are doing, how prosperous they are, and a question of whether or not they actually um, address the, the broad community if there is a need to revamp, revise some of our economic indicators or make them more broad so that we can look at the genuine um, progress indicators, I think they're called, um, to ensure that we're not just measuring a certain portion of our, our economy, but reflecting the whole thing and the people in it. Yeah, one great example of that is how we measure the labor market, and it's something we at the Fed are very focused on. And historically, we would look at the unemployment rate, the official unemployment rate, which is around 13% or 14%, somewhere in that today. We know that that is a flawed measure for a number of reasons. Number one, you know, they do, the government does these surveys every month. You have to actually be looking for work to be counted as unemployed. One of the things we learned in 2008, if you gave up and you said, you know what, I'm just, there's no hope. I'm not going to, I'm not looking because why am I going to bother? Then you're not counted as unemployed. But in fact, you did want to work, even though you were not actively looking for a job. And so that's one level. And we know that today many people are staying at home because we told them stay at home. We shut down the restaurants, et cetera. So many people are staying at home, not looking for work and not counted as unemployed, though they are in fact unemployed. I think the real unemployment number is probably around 20% today, not 13 or 14% today. And then if you look below the surface and you start getting into racial disparities, there are huge gaps between white Americans and black Americans, white Americans and Hispanic Americans in the unemployment rate at any given time in our economy. Typically, white black unemployment has a ratio of 2x. So if it's a recession and white unemployment is eight, black unemployment will be 16. If it's a booming economy and white unemployment is three, black unemployment will be six. Only at the, in the last year or so of the most recent expansion did we start to see some narrowing of that gap. And so that, for me as a central banker, that was enormously important to understand how many more people out there really wanted to work that we didn't appreciate. So the big surprise we had over the last four or five years, we kept thinking, that's it, we're at full employment. If we go any far beyond this, we're gonna overheat the economy and it's gonna to lead to inflation. It never happened. Because it turned out we were bringing people in who economists call marginally attached to the labor force. People who maybe wanna work but haven't been looking for a job, then they see their brother or their sister or their neighbor get a job and they think, you know what, that looks pretty good. I'm going to go get that job. And then they get a job. And so it just, it, it forces us to be more humble about how well we can really assess the labor market. And it, I am of the view, I have the belief that the vast majority of people want to work if given the chance. So let's give them the chance. Thank you. Uh, a similar question in terms of, um, some of the things that might be more invisible and we're going to turn to childcare and the importance of having good childcare options and how it has been really brought home to us during the crisis. Um, a number of the childcare providers in particularly rural are home-based providers. They aren't businesses, they're home-based industries and they haven't really received the same recognition, particularly under the CARES Act that some of the, the chains might have been. How can federal policy um, start reflecting that these are a part of our childcare industry, even if they're not corporations, but just mom and pop businesses. No, I think, that's a, I think that's a great point. I think the, the mom and pop childcare providers are enormously important. And you know, it, it, there are shades of gray. It might be your next door neighbor, it might be somebody down the street, it might be an aunt, you know, it might be a grandparent. There are lots of, a lot of different people come together to actually help take care of kids to so that the parents can go to work. And you're right, they do need recognition, just like the formal providers. One thing we saw happening, you know, in the, the last few years of the long expansion that we just had, we saw home-based childcare options dwindling, going down. Why? 
because the provider said, you know, I can make more money and go to work at Target. If you actually do the math on what home child care workers make, a home-based daycare worker, it's minimum wage around there, maybe a buck an hour more. And if Target or Walmart are paying 13 bucks an hour, a lot of people said, I'll go work at Target. And it's a lot less complicated, a lot less risk, and I can just go and you know, clock in my eight hours and, and make money that way. So as the economy got stronger, the home-based childcare options actually went down. So one perverse thing that I think we're gonna see now, or one benefit of a terrible economic crisis, you may actually see more home-based childcare options because those folks don't have the, the traditional jobs to go back to. And they, you know what, they need to earn a living, they can offer childcare services to their communities as, as, a, uh, as an option right now. So this is a, it's a fluid, very complicated market that it's hard to, uh, hard to paint with one, bro with one brush. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, we know that Native communities um, have been struck um, by COVID, particularly hard in some parts of the country. And um, we're interested in what your, your research in the Indian country indicates what priorities might be going forward and specifically how can philanthropy support that or partner with, with the tribes or with the Fed to, to ensure some of those things get implemented? Well, we've been working on, my colleagues have done a great job of this, working with the Federal Reserve of Washington and the U.S. Treasury Department. So the Federal Reserve has launched a program called Main Street Lending, which is for bigger businesses than the small businesses for the PPP. And tribal businesses are intend to be, intended to be able to participate, but there are limits on, oh, you're not supposed to be paying dividends or buying back your stock, et cetera. But tribal businesses are unique because tribal businesses, in many cases, are the only source of revenue for tribal governments because tribal governments don't actually have taxing authority. So we've been working with our colleagues in Washington to say, hey, tribal businesses need to have different restrictions put around them than an auto parts company or some other manufacturer, et cetera. And so that's something that we've been doing just to try to make sure the policymakers in Washington understood some of these differences. But I think you, know, you all partnering with them, first and foremost on the healthcare front, making sure that they have the, whatever healthcare resources they can get to address the root of the crisis, that's of paramount importance. I mean, anything that any of us does, anything we do that can shorten the, the duration of a healthcare crisis will lead to an economic recovery more quickly. So that has got to, for all of us, that's got to be our first priority, addressing the root healthcare crisis. So that's number one. And then number two, helping them recognize that you know, many tribes have casinos. For those that have casinos, that's the dominant uh, source of revenue for that tribe. And if the casino is shut, the tribe is obviously devastated economically. Again, there is some money coming from the CARES Act and the other provisions in Washington, but helping them figure out, can they reopen safely? I mean, I saw TV shows that Las Vegas is reopening. They're putting plastic shields up, et cetera. I don't know how well it's going to work, uh, but could you help the tribes to figure out hey, how can you reopen your businesses safely so you can get some revenue coming in until we can really arrest the, the virus itself? Along those lines, um, are there particular parts of our economy, particular sectors that the Fed is worried about, and you know who's here and, and the folks who are here are involved in rural, what can Red Group members do to help partner with the Fed in those initiatives or address some of those gaps for those sectors of the economy you're really worried about? Well, the big, I mean, I think the biggest concern, people talk about will this be a V-shaped recovery? I think it's going to be a much more gradual recovery. In early March when the virus flared up, I think we were all optimistic. Maybe you do a two-month hard shutdown and then you snuff out the virus and then you reopen and we go back to normal. And that's what a lot of the programs from Washington were designed to do. Like the PPP was meant to be a, a two-month bridge. Well, if some of these businesses have to be shut for a year, what do you do? And not only is it devastating for that business, if you, if you have waves of bankruptcies, so picture in a rural community or in a city, and you have a restaurant that goes out of business, and you have that out of business sign on that restaurant, how long does it take for a new restaurant to form, to move into that space, to refurbish the space, 
to hire the staff and to reopen. That's what's going to make the recovery even slower if we end up having these waves of small businesses that go out of business. Um, and so I would say anything you can do partnering with us or partnering with the Small Business Administration to make sure that businesses are taking advantage of the programs that are being offered. Right, right. Like I said, the PPP program is out there. There's still money available. If businesses have not taken advantage of it, they should. That is money available to try to help them get through this. Or now the Main Street Lending Program, which I talked about, which is for somewhat bigger businesses, but not. We're not talking about General Motors. We're talking about you know larger, but still uh, not giant businesses. Um, make sure that they know about it. Make sure that the banks know about it get the message out to take advantage of the programs that are available. And that's probably the first thing uh, that I would say. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Neil. I think we have used up as much time as we said we would. We have a list of questions that didn't get answered and I'll, I'll make sure those are made available to your staff, but we really appreciate your insight and your perspective and especially your willingness to engage and spend most of the time answering questions.